Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. I am your host, Sarah, and I am bringing you another author interview this week. I have said it before, but I'm going to say it one more time because I just, I, I'm so lucky that I get to talk with all of these amazing authors and read their books and bring them to you. And hopefully you will read their books and maybe learn, not learn, but maybe find a new author or a new genre that you haven't explored before. So today I am talking with Robin Lee about her book, The Idea of You. I will read you the back of the book so you have an idea of what the book is about. It says, Selene Marchand, a 39-year-old owner of an art gallery in Los Angeles, is reluctant to take her daughter, Isabel, to meet her favorite boy band. But since her divorce, she's eager to be closer than ever to Isabel. The last thing Selene expects is to make a connection with one of the members of the world-famous August Moon. Hayes Campbell is clever, winning, confident, and posh, and the attraction is immediate. But he is all of 20 years old. A series of clandestine trysts quickly evolves into a passionate and genuine relationship. Selene and Hayes' journey spans continents as they navigate each other's worlds, from stadium tours to international art fairs to hideaways in Paris and Miami. For Selene, it is a reclaiming of self, as well as a rediscovery of happiness and love. When Selene and Hayes' romance becomes a viral sensation and both she and her daughter become targets of rabid fans and an insatiable, insatiable media, Selene must face how her romantic life has impacted the lives of those she cares about most. So that is the description on the back of the book of The Idea of You by Robin Lee. And this was a really really fascinating look into this kind of um, social construction that we have around relationships and age and age differences. It flips that idea on its head, how, you know, in society, we often see older men and younger women and don't really think anything of it. But when we see older women with younger men, we start to project and we place all of these uh, ideas and thoughts on them and judgments. And so this book is looking at a lot of that. It really takes a good look at that social construction of relationships, that social construction of age differences, how that can look, how that comes across to a variety of different people, what they think. It also looks at the perspective of Selene is 39. She turns 40 in the book and she does live in Los Angeles. So she lives in this world where looks are so very important and um, you're seen differently as a woman the older you get. So it's an exploration of not only relationships, but how the perceptions of women and beauty and age all change as we go through life. And it's just a really, really interesting look into all of that. It's very well done. It's very well written. It is all of those things. What it is not is PG-13. It is a romance and it's got some pretty good, intense, um, intimate scenes in it. It is pretty heavy on the F-bomb, and I don't say that as a judgment. I just say that to give you a heads up for those of you who, you know, may may or may, may not be comfortable with that sort of thing in your reading. But it is very steamy. It is very intense, but it also is also very well written, and it explores all of those other things that I was just speaking about, all those other tropes, all of those other themes, all of those other issues that we, especially as women, face in our lives as we navigate our lives and we navigate getting older and we navigate relationships. So definitely a good read. Definitely it's, you know, it's not um, a lighthearted read in any way. It, it, it's a romance, yes, but it really does explore those others. And it is um, 
it, it as it said it takes place on multiple continents so it is full of travel and so there's a lot of fun elements in this book um but it also does have those deeper underlying issues. And that is probably enough out of me. I would love for you instead to hear what Robin herself has to say about this book. So let's go ahead and turn to that interview. I spoke with her. She was at home in uh, Los Angeles. She's actually been traveling, so it was very kind of her to take some time out of the time that she had with her family in, while she was home to speak with me about her book, The Idea of You. So here is that interview. Hi, Robin. Thank you so much for joining me. How are you today? I'm fine. Thank you. Great. So before we get started talking about your book, I would love for my listeners to get to know you just a little bit. So whatever you're comfortable sharing, we'd love to hear about you. Um, okay, let's see. What am I comfortable sharing? I'm pretty flexible. Uh, <laughs> let's see. I, uh, I'm, I'm from New York. I was born and raised in New York. I am the daughter of immigrant parents from Jamaica, uh, which I think has colored my life and experiences tremendously. I grew up in a very Jamaican household, very traditional kind of um, strict, huge British influence. Uh, my family, my parents are, I'm, I'm a mix of Jamaican, Chinese, English, Scottish, and Arawak Indian. Oh, wow. So yeah, it's, it's a lot going on. Uh, I grew up in Westchester County, which is a suburb of Manhattan, and then I I went to Yale. Um, I have always enjoyed acting and writing. They're two things that have meant a lot to me. But on the car ride up to Yale, my dad said to me, don't think we're sending you to Yale to study drama. <laughs> so I majored in psychology. <laughs> and then when I graduated from college, <laughs> there that, that Jamaican mentality of like education, education kicked in even more. And they said, well, what, what, um, you've got an option now. It's either business school or law school. So I made a deal with them that I would apply to law school if I could study acting in New York. And so I was doing that. And I, I did a lot in that, in that period. I was, I'd started a, a company with a, a girlfriend and we were managing singing groups. Um, and one of the new kids on the block was a producer for a, a girls group that we were managing at that time. And it's when they were kind of like at the height or just coming down from the height of their fame. And so I, I was able to experience the music industry and, and see what it was like to be around that kind of craziness and the boy band and uh, that fandom and chaos and just the music industry in general. And it was quite interesting and exciting. I also, uh, I interned for Elle magazine when I was in college and I spent a year in France and Paris studying and also working for their French offices I feel like all these things kind of shaped me, my experiences and my interests. And uh, and then I, I, I guess I was, I was acting in New York. I went to law school at Columbia. I was doing the, both simultaneously. And then I graduated from law school, took the bar in New York, and moved to L.A. and have not looked back. Although I do pay my dues to the New York bar every two years. I'm a member of the New York bar just in case anything you know, <laughs> fall through and I need a backup plan. And your parents, you know, they, they made the deal with you. So they were okay with you then pursuing acting after you graduated? I think they just wanted me to not be homeless is really right. what it came down to. And they weren't certain that I could make any money doing anything in the arts. And so that was the backup plan. Um, and so all along the time, I, I, I was writing. I was doing it for fun. I, I wrote my first book for myself, handwritten when I was 14 years old, it was 884 pages. I still have it in my closet. That's <laughs> impressive. It's impressive. And then I um, I started another one when I was 16 years old. And I think I stopped writing that when it got to be about 1,200 pages. And I thought, this is not really going anywhere. <laughs> but these were just things I did for me. I didn't sit down to actually think, okay, let me see what I can publish until – after uh, my first child was born, I spent six, I was acting at the same time, but with acting, there's so many lulls. It's like a roller coaster ride. And you've got these periods of like, you're not doing anything. And if you're a creative person, uh, you need to, I mean, for me anyway, I need to be creating art or doing something with my brain. Um, and acting, you're, you're kind of waiting for permission. You know, it's, it's always a collaborative effort. You're waiting to be hired. And it, it's a lot goes into getting work. And I love the fact that I could just sit down and write anywhere. So I spent six hours, six, sorry, six years 
working on this novel that I did not sell. And I, then I kind of shut down after that and thought, okay, I'm done. And for two years, I did nothing at all. And then in the spring of 2014, I was hit with this idea. And I thought, this is, I kind of like this. And the more I wrote, the more I thought, oh, I, and I, and showed it to people early on. I, it was kind of like, I think I could actually really publish this, but I didn't want to drag it out for six years. It's like, I want to do this as quickly as possible because if it's not going to sell, I don't want to be heartbroken that I've given so much of my time to something again. Mm -hmm, Sure. Um, so I, that that was the beginning of the idea of you, and I and I wrote the entire thing in pretty much a year and three months, and then got an agent and spent three months doing his his notes, and two weeks later we sold it. We're going to hear more from Robin and more about her book, The Idea of You. She's going to talk more about the plot and the characters, but we do have to take our first break of the podcast, so stay tuned, and we will be right back. Welcome back to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Today, I am speaking with author Robin Lee about her book, The Idea of You. Let's get back to that interview. So tell us a little bit about the book itself, about the plot and the characters. Uh, so the story, The Idea of You, is about a woman named Selene Marchand, who is a 39-year-old art dealer in Los Angeles. She's a sophisticated French-American woman. She's divorced. She has a 12-year-old daughter, Isabel. And her daughter is obsessed with this British boy band um, named August Moon. And Selene takes Isabel to a concert and meet and greet with the band after her husband flakes. He's supposed to take him and doesn't. And uh, at the meet and greet, she, she meets you know the band. And one of the guys in the band falls for her. And he's 20 years old. And they embark on this relationship that affects every aspect of her life. Um, and it's as much a, a a love story as it is a story about ageism and sexism and being a parent and, and a, a mother specifically and the choices we make and how we put others' happiness above our own. Um, it's about how women, just when they are coming into their power, are suddenly often, or not so, but often viewed as invisible as we get older society has these ideas that we are no longer viable or sexually desirable or we've lost our value. And I really wanted to explore that. And it also takes a dark look at the underside of celebrity and, and things people don't often see and, and the realization that it can be very uh, intrusive and debilitating to and uh, just dark to, to, to always have to be on and how much your privacy is is compromised when you become a public figure and or you be, you are in love with a public figure and thereby <laughs> relieve I mean uh, receive some of their uh, I don't want to say glory but kind of their attention from their celebrity it, it's 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 interesting because it's that flip of the norm that we see in society where you know nobody bats an eye if it's a 39 year old man with a 20 year old yeah. um yeah. or even if they do bat an eye they're just like oh you know whatever <laughs> but it's right. it's it's sort of this big scandal almost when it's the other way around exactly. and Hayes is an interesting character, the the boy band, you know, the mm-hmm. the boy band character because he is 20 and yet he's also very mature for his age in some ways. Yes. And they find this interesting balance. So was that your idea from the start was to have this, it, it seems like it would kind of have to be, you know, that you had this idea to have this, this relationship with this age difference. Did you start yeah. from that point or did it evolve over time? It, 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 it was always going to be an age difference. I, I, I kind of tell the story about, I, um, I, I was, in the spring of 2014, my husband was away on business and I was up late one night and I was surfing uh, YouTube and I came across a video with of a band and there was a boy in the band, a guy, I call him a boy, who was absolutely beautiful, but definitely young. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and I, but it was like one of those faces that kind of just stops in your tracks. And I, I spent about an hour like Googling him and discovered that he was pretty much half my age. 
Um, but that he occasionally dated older women. And so that kind of planted the seed. And my husband came back from his business trip and two days later. And I, I told him, I was like, I found the perfect guy. I'm thinking about leaving you and our two kids. But he's 20 and he's in a boy band. How do you feel about that? <laughs> he was like, you're crazy. But that would make a great book. And he no sooner said it than I thought, oh, my goodness, that would. And I could write it because I'd had these experiences. I, I, I knew what that li life was like. I knew what the darker side of celebrity was like and what it is to be in the spotlight. I knew what it was to spend time with the boy band and, and the machinations, like the interpersonal relationships between the members and also just how you are sheltered in some ways and, and, and you're living in kind of in a cocoon and and I knew it was to be a woman getting older and kind of questioning, like, am I still sexually attractive or viable? And how is the world seeing me versus how am I seeing myself? And how is, is my view of myself shifting because of how the world's view of me is shifting? You know, things like, I think, things that we ask ourselves. Um, for me, it's magnified because I'm an actress and I'm here in Los Angeles. And unfortunately, so much of uh, this business uh, relies on how you look and, you know, being sexually attractive or whatever that is. And so I'm, I, I've become very aware of it. I mean, I talk, I discuss it with my actor friends all the time. Like you're, you're, you're trying to keep up with a, an, a model, an ideal that that's, it's not that doesn't exist. It's, it's just difficult. It's right. difficult. The right. expectation is high. And so I know, knew what that was like and I wanted to explore it. And I'd never, I dated guys who were younger than me, but never by this, I mean, you know, no more than like five or seven years younger. Mm -hmm. I've been married for a while now. So for me, for me to date someone, a 20 year old, you know, it's, it's been 20 years. Right. It, <laughs> um, it really made me stop and think about the 20 year olds I know. And I was like, nope, mm -mm, no, no, thank you. <laughs> not that they're not lovely people, but I'm just like, no, they're just a little too young right now. Right. But then I knew I, the kind of character I was creating was Selene. I had this very specific idea of this woman that I thought would be um, compelling and interesting. I didn't know anything about the art world. And it's, it, it was an industry that had always fascinated me. And I thought, I don't know, there's something mysterious and uh, alluring about it. And I thought, if I could figure this, if I could explore this world as thoroughly as possible and put her in it and find a way to put her in it, I think that might be the right way to go about this. And so once I did that and I figured out who she was going to be, like I had to make him a man that could hold her interests. Mm -hmm. And so enough that, you know, he was famous or and attractive. I want, he had to be intelligent. He had to be bred a certain way. He had to be interesting. He had to be able, sophisticated and have sophisticated tastes and be able to hold his own in conversations and, and, and things that, you know, that he thought about and so forth. And I think I was able to do that um, successfully with him and still make him real. And, you know, and every once in a while that you see the 20 year old come out. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, you know, I, I, it was, it was a lot of fun creating him. I had, I had a really good time with him. Um, sorry. Okay. You were going to say something. Oh no, it's okay. I was just thinking as you were talking about, uh, Selene being, um, part of the art world, that was one of my, my questions as I was reading through the book was, you know, if you, if that was something that was part of your life, if you were interested in art and, uh, also how much of that. So since you mentioned that you, um, didn't know a lot about that world and you wanted to put her in that world, how much research did you do? You know, are, are the artists that she works with real artists that you researched or are some of them fiction? How did that work? Uh, so I did a, a good deal of research. I knew very, very little about the art world. I, I mean, I took, you know, an art history class in college 20 something years ago. Uh, but I didn't know I knew very little about contemporary art. I knew some big named artists, obviously, but I didn't know how the day to day or, or, or the, the business or the industry or about festivals or any of it and, and the price points and what is considered a value and what's not. Um, and when I first started writing, my my daughter was in preschool and I was talking to another mom and I was telling her that I was writing this book. And I was like, I, I, just, I think I want to put in the art world and my woman owns a gallery. And the mother goes, I own a gallery. And I was like, you're kidding me. And, I, and she said, where's where's your character's gallery? And I told her, she's like, that's where my gallery is. Like literally it was on the same block. Oh, wow. 
a couple of years, a year prior, I'd gone to an art exhibit at Bloom and Poe, which is this very big um, art gallery they've got there in New York, LA, uh, where else? Maybe, maybe Japan, um, maybe London. I can't remember. But there, I, I'd gone to a, a gallery, a friend's opening an exhibit, and it was such an eclectic group of people that I could not get enough of. Like you, you, everyone is very individual and unique and interestingly dressed. And it was just like this, this other world that existed. And, and I thought this was very, very, very cool. And they have some of these things called art walks. Like it's every, I guess it's the first, oh, I used to know this when I was writing, I knew this. I, I think it might be the first Saturday night of the month is when new exhibits open. And so a, a bunch of galleries will open, will have their, their, their openings then. And so People come in, they go from gallery to gallery, and you're, you're drinking wine, you're moseying, you're looking at art. And it was like this other world that I did not know about. And so I thought, well, that's where I'll put Selene's gallery. And it turned out my friend's gallery was there as well. And so she said, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. So often when I see the art world portrayed in literature or television or films, it's done incorrectly. And she said, if you do this, I'm going to, she's like, you know me and I know you, and I'm going to make certain that your book is, is true to what the art world really is. And, uh, she was a huge help. And I said, I, I have, I don't even know where to start asking questions. So give me a few months to like read as much as I can do as much research as I can. So I, so I can come in at, with like a base, you know, level of knowledge. Um, and so that's what we did. And I, I read a lot and then I came in with specific questions and she was very helpful and she took a couple of passes of the script and would be like, I wouldn't use this term. You would use this term or like, I wouldn't use this gallery so forth. Um, so it was good. Uh, all the artists that I mentioned, like at shows at, 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 uh, at the bigger fairs are real. So lens artists are all fictional with the exception of maybe four that I mentioned who were actual friends of mine who were artists who's, who I was able to get their permission to use their name and their work. Oh, like that's it. great. It was so lovely get to get to know this, this world that I'd admired from afar, but knew nothing about and, and to explore that. And it was, it was really, it was one of the perks I think of writing this book is just is gaining insight into something else completely different. And all I could think of is I should have done this. I should have done this with my life. <laughs> <laughs> Travel the world and, you know, spoken different languages and, you know, been able to do that. If I'm honest with myself, I think that every time I interview an author, I speak with them and I'm like, man, I wish I did that. I wish I'd done what she'd done or he'd done and um, lived that life. So I kind of maybe a little bit understand what she's talking about there. We do have to take our second break of the podcast, but there's more to come with my interview with Robin Lee. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. We are about to conclude my interview with author Robin Lee. Her book is The Idea of You, and let's go back to the interview. Each chapter takes place in a different location, and Selen speaks how many languages? At least four, maybe in a smattering of more. Um, do you travel? Do you speak other languages? I, I'm fluent in French. French. I used to live in France. I lived in Paris for years, I'd mentioned. Um, and I worked at a French company. And so I, it, it, I'm a huge Francophile. And it's always been a part of me, I mm -hmm. suppose. And I kind of, I, I decided that when I was, had kids, I was going to raise them bilingually because I could, and I wanted them to learn it young. Um, I'm not always good about that. but <laughs> It's much easier to speak to them in a foreign language right up until the point that they start arguing and wanting to negotiate with you. <laughs> I'm, I can imagine. <laughs> and you flip to English really quickly. <laughs> um, so uh, we, and we go, we go to France often and, and I'm fluent in French. So I have that and I have some Italian. I used to speak it much better than I do now. Uh, but I do, I travel a lot. I love, I love to travel. And I think also from being from another place and seeing, I mean, having my parents being from Jamaica and, and, seeing uh the world differently and more like i guess a more international perspective is uh 
something that I've always, I think it's just a huge part of me. Like I, I want to be a citizen of the world. And I, I'd visited most of the places in the book before I'd even started writing. And so I knew I could, I could, uh, use those, those places as locations. And then others I researched. Okay. And you mentioned earlier, you know, that, that you're, you like to be able to write during your breaks from acting and that you can, you know, it gives you something creative to do. How do you find that writing or acting influences your writing? Do you, do you, do you see any crossover in your two careers? Um, I think, yes, I do. And it's very interesting because they're, they're very, I approach them quite differently. I mean, acting, you're very much in your body and writing, you're, you're all in your head. Um, but I feel like there are, are techniques that I've learned for acting that is, that have made me a, a better writer. One is, uh, an affinity for dialogue and, and knowing, and under, knowing when something feels right and it doesn't in, in speech patterns and, and how conversations flow. Um, I definitely read out loud to myself as I'm writing. I'm, I'll read a scene over and over a line of sentence of fragment dialogue. I'm not acting it out, but I'm just saying it over and over again so that I can hear it. So I feel like I have a good ear for that. I also have a good ear for meter and like the rhythm of writing. I think that's from like studying people like Shakespeare or uh, David Mamet or and you get you, you have these different playwrights that you study and you over and over you're, you're learning the importance of meter. And I think that kind of rhythm comes from the theater. And I think that definitely I, I employ in my writing. Uh, and then we have something in acting we call um, sense memory, which is when you rely on a memory, a specific memory and some kind of sensorial, something specific in the sensorial uh, how do I, how do I, how do I phrase this correctly? Something, something sensor, sensorial that you remember to help you remember that exact memory. And you, you rely on that to bring it to life for you in the present. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. And so like, let's, we do these exercises where we remember something typically traumatic from our past. Um, let's say you were bullied as a child and you have one specific example when one day you're on the playground and whatever it was and some kid who said something and pushed you down in the dirt and the kids laughing at you and taunting you and what you remember is let's say the feel of your skinned knee in that dirt and you kind of go to that and you remember it and so you're trying to recall these things that you can use them in a scene that's current and the ability to remember things like that sensorially i think lends to interesting writing and the way that writers kind of, we go into a room when we make observations and we take things in, but we don't necessarily, we don't necessarily uh, hold on to the, the sense, like the smells, the sounds, the tastes, the touch, all that stuff. As actors, we kind of lock all that away. You're taught actors never forget and you try to remember everything and then you, and you try to bring it back up. I feel like I use that more in writing than I get to writers who would not have an acting background. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it actually sounds a little bit like Hayes' character because he, that comes up a bit, it, you know, that he remembers everything. Right. <laughs> so that's what that reminded me of. In terms of your writing process, do you have a, do you like to keep to a, a schedule when you are writing? Do you have a favorite place to write? No, I'm all over the place. Uh, when I'm writing, I, it, I can be very obsessive and I write around the clock when I can, meaning I take my laptop with me everywhere and I write at Starbucks and I write in my car while I'm waiting for my kids to finish gymnastics practice, whatever, water polo. I take it with me to their doctor's appointments and write in waiting rooms. Um, I stay up to ungodly hours of the morning writing, 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 and then I wake up early and I start all over again. Um, and there is not, there is not one favorite place. Uh, but then I also go through long periods when I don't write and I know, I know I should be writing every day, but I just, I can't, life gets in the way and I don't have anything that I feel is really, really, um, pertinent at the moment. And, you know, sometimes I'll, 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 I'll have a few documents open at all points of time that I can open it up and write down some notes and I'll come back to this or I'll just write a paragraph or a bit of a conversation, whatever. But I, but I don't feel like I have to sit 
down in front of that document and write for an hour straight if I don't, if it's not coming to me. Mm -hmm. Are you working on any, anything right now? I'm working on a few different things, but they're all kind of early yeah. and I'm not ready to talk about them yet. Yeah. Okay. You know, in all of your free time, it sounds like you have so much free time. <laughs> uh, do you like to read? And if so, what's your, do you have favorite genres or authors? Um, I love to read. Uh, I don't have very much free time, but I do love to read. And I read a lot of literary fiction and women's fiction. Um, I love books about uh, this search for identity, I think, and I, how identity intersects with race and class and culture. I love books like Arundhati Roy's The God of Small Things, let's say, or uh, Curtis Sittenfeld's Prep or Zadie Smith's White Teeth. Like I love seeing the world through different perspectives and seeing characters, typically female characters, but I'm open to male. I, I can be open to male. Um, <laughs> exploring the world and seeing it through their eyes, like someone, especially someone who's not like me and who's, who's growing up with a completely different experience. Mm -hmm. Those are the books that are, are really, that always pull me in. I love great love stories, like, but they don't, for me, it doesn't, it doesn't have to have a, it doesn't have to be formulaic. It doesn't have to be a happy ending to be a great love story to me. Like something like Ian McEwan's Atonement, let's say, mm -hmm. which I loved. And, you know, I was devastated, but it was beautiful and powerful and stuck with me for a long time. Uh, I felt that way too about like uh, the time traveler's wife. And sometimes they're just, I don't know, characters that, that relationships that you hold on to. I, I'm thinking right now of, um, Lionel Shriver's book, We Need to Talk About Kevin. And I never saw the movie, but the book was so powerful to me. And I I just felt for this woman, this mother, and the relationship with her child and her, her, her troubled son and the daughter and the husband and all that. Like, those stories just kind of resonate and, and stick with things that, like, stick with me for a long time are the ones that I just kind of, I really love. I'm trying to think of a good love story recently. Um of Fates and Furies, Lauren Groff. Mm -hmm. That was a, a great one that I read recently. Um, and then there's like lighter fare that I like as well. I feel like I'm all over the place. <laughs> I'm all over, I like to read. That's great. I like, I like to see different perspectives. Do you read with uh, your kids? Not as much as I used to. I did a lot when they were little, but mm -hmm. we're trying to get them to do more independent reading. My kids are eight and 12 now, so. They're, they're reading on their own. So, Do they have anything, any favorites that you know of? I'm totally nosy right now. I just love knowing what None other people are reading. John was really, really, really into the Wimpy Kid uh, mm -hmm. series. He still is. My daughter is just telling me something, a new series she's into. It's got the word dog in it. It's David Plinky. Plinky? Pilky? I can never remember this guy's last name. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of what else they read they loved wonder they love the writer and i'm gonna get her name right, wrong so i'm not even gonna try actually she wrote smile okay I love, like renee tellum garden or something like that she wrote smile and then she wrote another one sisters maybe mm -hmm. she has a third one they they love her books okay well thank you i appreciate that um where can people find you on social media? I am very, very active on social media. You can find me at on Twitter at, at Robin Lee, which is R-O-B-I-N-N-E-L-E-E, -E -E, or on Instagram at, at Robin Lee as well. Um, and Facebook, I'm the Robin Lee, R-O-B-I-N-N-E-L-E-E. -E -E. There's actually a Facebook page for the idea of you because there's been a, a pretty large uh, a group of fans of the book. And there's a, there's a private... Facebook, a closed group for the idea of you as well. And you're welcome to just send a request. And unless you're a serial killer, you'll probably get it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good to know. Serial okay. killers need not apply. Yes. Um, and on Goodreads. I'm on Goodreads as well. Okay. But I, I, I'm, I'm pretty active and I read all my uh, messages and, I, and I'm pretty good about getting back to people. Okay. So. Do you have a website, an author website? It's robinlee.com. Okay. R-O-B-I-N-N-E-L-E-E. -E -E. Perfect. That, 
And is there anything, as we're wrapping up, anything else that you would like for people to know about your book or about, um, just about your book? About my book, let's see. I think it's, uh, I, I, I've, I, in this experience of writing, it's so interesting because I feel like I've gotten, the response has been different than I expected in the way that <laughs> people have been asking for a sequel. Mm. Um, and I wrote this book as a, a standalone. I don't, I, I, it was never meant to be a series. Right. But the demand has been so great that I, I've started thinking about it and uh, outlining a little bit and writing down little bits here and there. I don't know whether or not that's going to happen Okay. entirely, but that's kind of where I am. But I'd be I think intrigued the, to know where you would go with it. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. But I, but I think it's, I, I find it, uh, flattering that people have connected so much with these characters that they don't want to let go of them. They're Absolutely. Not and I feel really kind of, um, I guess lucky or happy. And, and that, that's the case because I definitely fell in love with them and it was a very obsessive thing for me for about a year and a half. And, um, emotionally a huge roller coaster of having these people live in my head and experiencing everything they were experiencing as they were experiencing it and feeling as if I was in this relationship with them. Um, and I think that people should go into the book. I, I don't, I don't like to give away too much. I think you need to go with an open mind and mm -hmm. then see where the journey takes you. Yeah. Well, I really, really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're very busy and I know that you are, um, home with your family. So I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me and talk to me about your book and um, just good luck with writing whatever you're working on right now. Thank you so much, Sarah. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, I want to thank my guest, Robin Lee, author of The Idea of You. You should definitely check this book out. It is, as I said, romance, but it's also so compelling in its uh, character development and in its examination of relationships and the roles of women and the perceptions of women and relationships in general. And so I highly encourage you to check it out if it's something that you're interested in. As always, you can find all of our podcasts at www.gsmcpodcast.com. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram, GSMC Book Review. We would love to hear from you. And you can download the podcast on iTunes um, on our website. You can listen to it on our website. You can download it on SoundCloud, Stitcher, all of those apps that you use on your mobile devices. You can find us there. So thank you, as always, for joining me. I hope you will join me again next week when I am not 100% sure that I will have another guest. I am working on a return guest to the podcast, which I'm really excited about. It is going to happen. I think it will be next week. We just have to see if our if our um, schedules can mesh up. I'm not going to give it away because I don't want to then have to come back next week and say, no, I lied. That's not really what we're doing this week. So hopefully next week, return author to the podcast. In the meantime, go out there and get yourself lost in a good book. Thank you. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.